As of last year, from a statistical standpoint, we now know that there are one to three Earth-sized planets or smaller around each and every star in the galaxy. The next time you go outside and look up at the night sky, just pick a random star. Planet. Planet. Yeah, two of them. Are Probably five. Five, yeah. five, five planets, four. one of them sitting in a habitable zone. <laughs> okay, well, so this is just a table of the five sort of most prominent exoplanet detection techniques. The way we discovered the first planet outside of our solar system was using a technique that we call the Doppler technique, or radial velocities. They measured the velocity of the star as a function of time. And here's zero, and there are you know, plenty of stars that just look like this. They're moving away from us, but at a constant rate. So there's probably nothing there. But if you see a star, the velocity, you know, it's changing yeah. and it maps out a nice sine curve. And then you ask the question, well, what do you know about physics that could possibly be making it move? Well, something must be tugging it. It's the same way that you can tell how fast the car is moving or a train by its sound. The faster the star is moving towards you, the closer together the wave fronts would be and the higher frequency or the bluer the light would appear. And then the faster it's moving away from you, the redder it appears. You have your sun. And then orbiting around it is a planet. And when the planet is over here, because of gravity, the planet gets tugged inwards, but also it tugs the star ever so slightly inwards. And then when it orbits here, the star gets tugged over here. And same thing, same thing. The period of this is one orbit, and the amplitude, how, how big it is, depends on the mass of the planet. Which is why the first thing that we saw was... They're called hot Jupiters. Because yeah. astronomers are very clever with our naming. Stuff. Right, yeah. <laughs> what we are actually observing is the spectrum of the star. But seeing the whole curve is really hard to measure. It'd be this featureless thing with nothing to grab onto. All these lines give us a handle to measure the velocity of the star. Every single atomic and molecular transition happening in the star is moving, getting Doppler shifts in the exact same way. So every single line has a story to tell about the motion of the star. And right now we can do like one meter per second, which is walking speed, which is really slow. That's 100 light years away. The shifts that we're talking about for these planets are extremely small. We're sampling this with a little CCD detector like the one in your camera phone. So we're watching the line shift by about a hundredth of a pixel, which is about the same size of um, 80 silicon atoms lined up end to end. That's crazy. Yes. <laughs> we are living in the future. So the analogy there is that you're standing right next to the world's brightest lighthouse and you look a lighter on. The act of seeing planets is analogous to being able to discern that flame next to this lighthouse when this lighthouse is in California and you're standing in Hawaii. That's the scale of the problem. And the only reason why we can even do it now, today, is because you have these crazy adaptive optics technique and this allows you to take away the blur of the atmosphere. And with that, we've been able to see exactly four other planets. HR 8799B, C, D, and E. And then there's like light curves or searching for planets that transit. What we do is, again, we point our telescope at a whole bunch of stars and we just track how much light we can see from them. And if we're staring directly face on and then you have a planet and it goes in front of a star, the light from the star goes down, so you just see a constant dip. And then it leaves the star and slowly goes back up. You try to find dips, periodic dips in light. You have a big planet on the small star, look how deep that goes. You know, there's a tiny planet, that little dot right there causing this tiny little dip in light, then you have kind of intermediate to both cases. You have to be so precise you can see a thousand difference. So Kepler was launched three and a half years ago. And every 30 minutes, it takes a measurement of the brightnesses of 160,000 stars. So you have to look at a lot of them because uh, just geometrically, the planet has to pass between you and the star. So Kepler has found about 2,500 what they call candidate planets. So we talked about transits here. And we have a star with a planet going around it. The planet has a very regular orbit. So now let's say we have a second planet in here. So the outer planet can tug on the inner planet and cause it to arrive late to its transit. And then a little bit later, it's ahead of it and it pulls it forward and it causes it to arrive early right. for its transit. So you actually see a nonlinear period. This then you can say beyond any reasonable right. doubt you have two planets here. So if you wanna really get down to magic, then you really have to get into relativity. Let's say we're standing over here and we're looking at a star here far away from us, all right? And then let's say that there's light from another star way back over here. The photons that travel from this star, when they get into the gravitational field of this star, it actually gets bent by the gravity of that star because anything with mass bends space and time and it actually acts as a lens. So it's called micro lensing. So people were doing that for a while. And then one day they got a secondary blip. And that's because this guy brought a buddy with him. 
you got a planet. And this lens delight got lensed again. Double lens. <laughs> when the planet was drifting by as well. My, my, my colleagues who does the Doppler technique, is, so she raises her hand in the middle of the talk and she's like, let me get this straight. You are measuring planets that you never see, around stars that you never see. Is that right? <laughs> Basically what you're doing. So, so the thing is, in, in 20 years, the consciousness of humanity went from, gosh, I wish, there's gotta be like some planets out there, right? 20 years ago, right? to now, so there are literally billions, maybe trillions, mm -hmm. of planets in our galaxy. And that's so, just our galaxy. Yeah, the same number of stars that there are in our galaxy is the same number of galaxies in the universe. Roughly, yes. Yeah. So there's a billion times a billion planets, yeah. Yeah. conservatively speaking. And, and when nearby. you start seeing all these planets and, and how, how they're arranged, then that starts to give you insight into how they could have formed, how the whole system evolved over the right. lifetime of that system. Fact, now you're basically connecting those diffuse blobs of gas and dust out there to living be beings. Yeah. That's what we're doing here. We're getting not only just finding planets, which is amazing in and of itself, but we're, we're basically tracing our past as humans back through the cosmos, going from where we are right now back to those dust lanes. And we're doing so by looking for little blips in the light from stars. We're looking for little wobbles in the stars caused by the gravitational tug of a planet. We're doing it through general relativity. We're taking pictures of planets. All of that in and of itself would be cool. But it goes so far beyond that. But we're revising our own origin story.